Okay, so good morning to the folks that are on. Uh, my name is Rory Kelly from the Consulting Services Group, and I'm just going to talk uh, about an introduction to sort of the HPC systems here at NCAR. This is intended for new users, so it's pretty basic stuff. Um, but that said, you know, we have a lot of systems and a lot of software and things to cover. So I just kind of want to make you familiar with what we have, give you the basics of how to access stuff. Um, and as I, I mentioned to BJ, um, you can ask questions any time. So I guess ask questions through the chat and then either I'll see them through the chat or BJ will read your questions aloud to me so I'm aware of them. So the things we're going to go through today are just what HPC systems we have that are available for their use and sort of what we recommend those systems to be used for, how to sign in uh, and how to sort of manage your data uh, on the system, what places are appropriate for what types of data. Uh, we'll talk about how to access some of the software that we build and provide and how you can build your own software, guidelines for doing that. Uh, how to manage jobs uh, using the batch schedulers on the different system. Because we have more than one system, um, they also have different batch schedulers. So the way you run jobs one place is a little different than how you run them on another place. Um, we'll talk a little bit about setting up your own environment, how to customize it. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is really a pretty introductory material. We have an excellent uh, amount of documentation that goes into much more depth on all of this stuff. And uh, any, anything that you don't get from the talk, if you don't um, have a question on it or if it's something comes up later, uh, you can always go to our documentation page. If you go to sizzle.ucar.edu slash resources, that's a good entry point to branch out and explore the documentation. And everything's covered in great depth there. So one of the, the systems we have on the floor um, is Cheyenne. And Cheyenne is kind of our large batch computing system. So it's appropriate for running large parallel jobs, doing model runs. That isn't to say those are the only things you can do there, but that's sort of like why the system exists. You know, uh, Our other system that we have is, is small, so you're not able to do things like run large models there. So if you have something like a wharf job uh, or a CESM simulation, Cheyenne is probably the place you're going to target uh, a run like that. So what is Cheyenne? It's 4,000 nodes, 4,032. Um, each of those nodes has two sockets, and each of those sockets has an 18-core Intel Broadwell CPU uh, running at 2.3 gigahertz. Um, there's different amounts of memory on the nodes. The, most of the nodes, a little over 3,000 of them, have 64 gigabytes of memory. And then 864 of those nodes are what we call large memory nodes. Um, and they have twice the amount of memory, 128 gigabytes of memory. So certain applications... Um, may need not that many CPUs, but more memory per CPU. For those, you would want to target large memory nodes. Uh, you can also sometimes use a mixture of large and small memory nodes. Like you might have a, the first MPI rank might need more memory than the remaining MPI ranks. So you could put that on one large memory node, for instance. Um, all of these nodes, all 4,000 of these nodes are connected by a pretty high speed network. Uh, it's InfiniBand is the technology um, that allows sort of efficient large parallel jobs to run efficiently using, you know, hundreds or thousands of nodes. Uh, it's a Linux based system and SUSE Enterprise Linux 12 is the precise version of Linux. Not that that matters too much to you, but it's just more to point out that the Linux on Cheyenne is not necessarily the identical Linux that's on our other systems. So you just need to be aware that there are differences between these things. And uh, jobs on the Cheyenne system are scheduled by the PBS job scheduler. And we'll talk a little bit about some basic PBS commands uh, in a bit. The other system we have on the floor is Casper. And Casper is a much smaller system, but its, uh, its purpose is more to do data analysis and post-processing, machine learning, and some GPU computing. Um, and there's actually a lot, you know, so there's a lot of stuff that we target towards the Casper machine, but Casper itself isn't very large. So uh, in the follow-on system to um, Cheyenne that'll be coming at some point in Casper, we'll, we, we anticipate having many more GPUs to do GPU computing type tasks and machine learning tasks in the future. But at the moment, uh, Casper is kind of the resource for that, and it can be a little bit constrained if you're a heavy GPU user. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, so Casper is 26 nodes. And all of the nodes are, are two-socket nodes, 18-core Intel Skylake CPUs. 
So this is a generation of CPU technology later than Cheyenne, um, but the same number of cores on a node. And again, that's just important to keep in mind because if you compile a program that, you know, if you compile it on Casper, it may not work on Cheyenne because the CPUs have some instruction differences between the two of them. Uh, the Casper nodes have more memory by, by a fair amount than the Cheyenne nodes. So the sort of the standard amount of memory is 384 gigabytes on a normal Casper node. And then the nodes that have GPUs, some of them have more memory than that. Um, also on these nodes, there's two terabytes of local uh, fast storage, NVMe flash storage. So that's available if you need to do, uh, you know, working with large files during the duration of a job, you can get some access to this fast SSD storage. Now again, Casper is a Linux-based system. As I mentioned before, it's a different Linux, so not all the things are available in exactly the same places as they would be on Cheyenne, but they're both pretty standard Linuxes. Uh, and then uh, again, the way you schedule jobs on Casper is very similar to Cheyenne, but it is a different scheduler, so the commands all have analogs, but they're all a little different. Um, Casper uses Slurm uh, as, as opposed to PBS on Cheyenne. And again, uh, GPUs are available on some of the nodes on Casper. So, and there's kind of a mix. So there's basically eight nodes that have a single GPU and 384 gigabytes of memory. And that GPU isn't um, a particularly, you know, fast or fancy GPU computing node. So these eight nodes are more if you, you can do some GPU computing on them for sure, but they're not beefy. It's more for visualization and things like that. Uh, there are two nodes that have um, some pretty fast GPUs, Tesla V100s. Uh, two, that, two nodes have four Tesla V100s, and those nodes also have 768 gigabytes of memory. And then four of the Casper nodes have eight of the same style card, eight of Teslas, and a little over a terabyte of memory. So those are the nodes you would target um, if you're doing sort of heavy GPU computing type tasks. Unfortunately, some data analysis code doesn't really need uh, beefy GPUs, but it does need a lot of memory. And those are also the nodes that you would use if you simply need a lot of memory. So there's some conflict between those two things at the moment, um, just because Casper is a small system. So we're hoping to grow that capability in the future. Okay, so before we even talk about how you get onto the systems themselves, I just want to mention uh, the account manager, account manager uh, systems account manager, Sam. Um, and Sam's a place where you can learn a little bit about the resources you have and how much computing you have um, under your account that you're able to do. So you access SAM at just sam.ucar.edu in your browser, and it's your sort of standard duo or YubiKey um, authentication. And when you're logged in, you can do a couple uh, changes to your user settings. So you can select what project you want to run out of by default, and you can also select your default shells on the various systems. Uh, and then probably the most interesting thing you'll learn from Sam is the amount of computing you have left, basically the amount of core hours you have in your allocation. You can see uh, a list of the jobs that you have run and how many core hours it took to run a certain job. And you can also get the balance and see how much you have left. Okay, so getting on to these systems. Um, Cheyenne and Casper, uh, you'll access both of them via SSH just to get a terminal. Um, if you're using, you know, Windows or something, you might be using PuTTY or some other SSH client um, from a standard Linux or an OS 10 system, you can just use the terminal. And then SSH dash uh, X, if you're going to want to be displaying any X back, X windows back um, to turn on X forwarding, then dash L your username. Uh, and then Cheyenne.ucar.edu to get you onto the Cheyenne system or Casper.ucar.edu to get you onto the Casper system. And that will land you on a login node. Um, so on Cheyenne, there are six of these login nodes. And on Casper, there are two login nodes. And the thing about these login nodes, particularly the Cheyenne system, you know, Cheyenne's a big system with a lot of things going on, but there's 4,000 nodes to do work and only six nodes that people share to access the system. So it's just important to remember that there are many, many people, typically, you know, tens to hundreds of people on these login nodes. Uh, and your usage is using resources that are also shared with other users. So the CPUs are shared and the memory is shared. So you shouldn't do things like try to run Wharf or something on a login node. Uh, so try to limit your usage to, you know, editing code, um, reading and writing files, compiling small, quick 
programs, uh, doing serial compiles, not, not big parallel compiles. If you need to do some data transfer, um, that, that's all fine on a login node. If you need to submit jobs to the scheduler, that's the primary reason the login nodes exist. So that type of sort of small, lightweight, interactive use is what they're intended for. If you actually need to be doing computing, um, you should schedule something on one of the batch nodes via the batch system. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and we have some tools. So if, you, you know, if you're running something expensive on a login node, we have some tools that run that sort of monitor usage and they will kill your jobs on a login node to keep the system usable for other users. So if you're doing something on a login node and your program gets killed, it's probably because it was using too much memory or too much CPU time. Okay, so where do we store data on these systems? Glade is um, a big parallel file system. Uh, I think, I believe it stands for the Globally Accessible Data Environment. And the global bit of that just means it's available on all the systems that Sizzle supports. So Glade is mounted everywhere. So whether you're on Cheyenne or Casper, or even some of the other smaller systems that I won't be talking about today, these file spaces will be mounted and they'll exist. And there are four primary classes of data uh, storage space that you have available to you. Um, the first one is your home directory. And the path for that on Glade is slash Glade slash U slash home, and then your username. When you first log into one of the systems, uh, that's where you will be. Um, the quota there is 25 gigabytes. And this space is the only space you have available that's backed up. Um, I heard a little bit of audio. Were you asking a question, BJ? I was just about to interrupt. There is a question. Um, yeah. We select which node uh, to log in on, on Cheyenne. You do not have to select which node. So there are six Cheyenne nodes, like I mentioned. Um, and if you just SSH to Cheyenne.ucar.edu, uh, the system will round robin you between one of those six nodes. Um, and that will place you somewhere, hopefully quiet. You can also target a specific node uh, by doing SSH Cheyenne1.ucar.edu or Cheyenne2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If you wanna um, get on a specific login node, and you might do that. Sometimes you might do something like have a screen session running on say Cheyenne 3, and you want to return to it later, then just SSH directly to Cheyenne3.ucar.edu. And similar for Casper, there's Casper 1 and Casper 26, so the login nodes there. Okay, so back to the uh, data storage. So your, your home directory, 25 gigabytes, it's important because it's the only thing that's backed up. So if you have important things like code you're working on, um, you should probably be using, you know, Git or some other sort of revision tool anyway. But if you have stuff that's kind of in progress, stuff you're working on, you want to keep it in your home directory because if something happens, you accidentally delete it. Um, we do have backups of the stuff in home. Uh, there's also a, a much larger space called work. Uh, you have a one terabyte quota there. It's not backed up. So, you know, don't put important things that you need to keep track of there, but larger things, you know, including compiled binaries, uh, maybe some data you can you can keep there. Just be aware that it's not backed up. So if it's important stuff, you need to manually back it up somewhere. Uh, then we also have a much larger space called Scratch. By default, you have a 10 terabyte quota there. We do occasionally extend uh, that quota to even larger than 10 terabytes on a per use basis as needed. So if you have a big project and maybe you, know, you need 100 terabytes of stuff, but you only need it for a couple months to get some work done, that's a thing where you can submit a help desk ticket to us and explain the situation. We'll often give you a little more space there because it's quite a large file system. Uh, the most important thing to know about Scratch is that it's purged. And um, that means basically we will delete your stuff after a certain amount of time just to make sure there's always room there. So at the moment, uh, I think the purge period is 120 days right now. But if the system were to suddenly become really full, um, we will change that retention period. So it might not always be 120 days. It's been as low as 30 days in the past. Uh, so you just need to keep in mind that stuff there um, will be deleted automatically. So you can't leave stuff laying around. It's really just meant for temporary storage. Uh, so things like this, um, where you're, you're doing a model run, the, the code itself runs for 12 hours. You can write intermediate results to scratch. And then they'll be around for you know a month or so. So you can you can decide where you want to take the important files from that run and back them up, but you can't leave them there forever. Uh, and then another class of storage is the project spaces. So there's no, no particular quota on the project spaces. It's kind of per project, the amount of space that's allocated. 
Um, and project space isn't automatically given to everyone, it's given to projects. So if you are associated with a certain project that has project space, then the PI of that project will let you know about the project space. Um, and again, that's not backed up, but it's not purged like Scratch. Uh, there's a command called Glade Quota too. So when you're logged into Cheyenne, you can type Glade Quota and it will show you your spaces and show you how much usage you have in each of the spaces. Okay, and then one more uh, place to store data. So I should say all, this, all the storage spaces I, mounted early, I mentioned earlier were um, just mounted everywhere. So if you didn't LS to any of those paths, you would see them. Campaign storage isn't necessarily mounted everywhere. It's mounted some places, uh, but uh, the primary method of accessing it is a little bit different. So campaign store is intended for storing um, data for a longer time. So publication time scale, you know, you write a paper and you need the data to be around for five years. That's what campaign store is intended for. Um, as such, like on Cheyenne, uh, it's not mounted. You can't access campaign directly through the terminal. So the primary access method is via Globus. Uh, on Globus, there's an endpoint called the NCAR campaign store. Um, so if you want to move files back and forth from campaign store to another location, we recommend primarily doing that through Globus. Uh, campaign is mounted on Casper, and it's also mounted on some other nodes that we uh, have called the data access nodes. So if you need command line style access, um, it is available via Casper. Uh, that's mainly to facilitate, you know, uh, putting, you know, Casper is where we sort of intend for you to do uh, post-processing. Uh, and so after you're done doing post-processing, you can directly, you know, copy or move data to campaign from the Casper nodes. And then also these data access nodes that I'm gonna, not going to talk about too much today or really ever again after this slide. But if you have a question about them, um, feel free to, to sit a, submit a ticket to us later or ask a question during this talk. Uh, we can tell you what the data access nodes are used for. Um, and campaign store is allocated. So it's given to NCAR labs in big chunks. And then within the lab, it's decided how it's going to be divvied up. Uh, it's also given to universities. So we just give big chunks of it out, but it's up to the individual universities and labs to decide how it's going to be used. So if you have a space uh, in campaign store, you will need to talk to whoever's administering that space, not to sizzle. Um, if you have questions about the amount of space you have available. Um, and then there's a couple more storage spaces that aren't for you to store data, but they are places for you to get data. So these are uh, what we call collections. And these are just curated data sets, basically. They're available on Cheyenne and Casper. Um, they're also available, you know, there's other ways to get this data, but we just want to point out they are available um, on Glade if you're logged into Cheyenne or Casper. So if you need to get some data, you don't need to go out and download it from the website. A lot of it is available already on Glade. Uh, two of the main data sets, there's quite a few things out there, but two of the main ones to mention are RDA, which is the Research Data Archive. Um, if you want more information about Research Data Archive, you can go to that link below. Uh, and that's available on Cheyenne and Casper at Glade Collections RDA. And also the CMIP6 data sets are available um, also on Cheyenne. So that's the coupled model in comparison project. Again, if you want more info at that link below. Um, but it's also mounted at Glade Collections CMIP, CMIP 6. Okay, so how do you get data on and off of Glade? There's a few methods um, for short transfers, uh, SCP, SFTP, those tend to work fine. That's for, you know, if you have small files, um, things that are less than a megabyte, things that are quick, yeah, no problem. That just for convenience, using SCP is great. For large transfers, you know, if you need to transfer 500 gigabytes or something from one location, you know, at your university or off of some other supercomputer to get it to uh, Cheyenne, F SCP would be a fairly slow method to do that. So we recommend Globus. Um, Globus is pretty speedy uh, for large transfers like this. It's sort of optimized for doing this type of work. Um, there's a couple, couple things you may need to use Globus. One, you'll need a Globus ID. Um, so you can create one, uh, you can, if you have a Globus ID, you can also authenticate, like for instance, your NCAR, um, NCAR user ID will work for logging you into Globus and letting you access our stuff. Um, and then 
you know, the place drawer. So if you're trying to transfer to or from Cheyenne, you'll be looking at the NCAR Glade endpoint or the NCAR campaign endpoint. That'll have all the stuff on Glade mounted. But you'll, you know, the other endpoint, if you're going to another university computer or something, that computer that you're going to will need to have a Glade endpoint. A lot of places already have endpoints set up, so you should just be able to search for them under Globus. Uh, if not, you'll need to talk to the administrators of a system and ask them to set up a Globus endpoint. Um, if you want to uh, connect to Globus and transfer something, say a large data file from Cheyenne to your personal workstation, Globus has a tool called Globus Connect Personal. Um, that you can install yourself on your laptop, um, as long as you have permission to install stuff on your laptop or workstation. And then Globus Connect Personal will allow you to use Globus to transfer files from your personal system uh, back and forth to NCAR, either from Glade or Campaign. Um, oh, I should say real quickly on that too. There is, there's both a kind of a GUI, a web interface, um, and there's also a command line tool. So you can do some scripting of automated moving of stuff to Globus via the command line tool if you want. Uh, and if you just want to browse and move stuff, the GUI is probably easier. Okay, so we provide a bunch of software um, that's pre-built and pre-installed. And the way we manage this software uh, for you to use is via environment modules. Um, you've probably heard of modules if you've worked on a shared system before. Uh, they provide access to all the software that we build. So, you know, compilers and debuggers and NetCDF and MPI and all that stuff that we build on Cheyenne. Um, if you want to use it, you use modules. And the reason modules is particularly handy is because it doesn't show you everything that's out there. It gives you a subset of stuff that will work together, um, which is good because there's a lot of stuff and a lot of it doesn't work together by default. So modules kind of helps you straighten out and keep track of the things that will play nicely with each other. Um, Cheyenne and Casper both have modules, but it's important to note that they're dis different collections of modules. So all the stuff on Cheyenne will not be available on Casper and vice versa. Some of the things that are available on Vols both might have different versions as well. So just keep in mind they are different systems. Okay, so I'm going to talk just about some really basic module commands. Um, again, our documentation covers this in a lot more detail, but these are kind of the basic things you would want to do with modules. So load and unload, um, put something in your environment to use. So if I did, uh, if I just log in to Cheyenne, I won't be able to, for instance, use NCL. I'd have to do module load NCL. And then NCL would then be in my path and I'd be able to use that software. Similarly, if I wanted to get rid of it, I would do module unload NCL and then it would no longer be in my path or my environment. Module avail, um, short for available, shows you anything that is able to be loaded. Uh, and I'll, I'll walk you through a schematic a little bit of why not everything is available to be loaded all the time in a moment here. But module avail just says, here's the stuff you are able to load if you want to. Module list will show you the things that you currently have loaded. Module purge is kind of like the reset button. It wipes everything out and you have nothing loaded. So that's kind of to restore yourself to a totally unmoduled state. Module save and module restore allow you to save sets of software. So if you, for instance, have uh, a set of software you'd like to have loaded when you're doing analysis, say, you could do module save, you could call it analysis. And then later on when you log into the system, you can do module restore analysis and it will reload all that software without you having to load uh, individually piece by piece. And module spider um, is a command to search the entire module tree so for instance, if I wanted to know, do you guys have R available on the system, but I didn't want to do module avail and look for R, I can do module spider R and it will show me if it finds anything that sounds like a fit. So module spider and then the thing you're searching for will search for a particular amount of software in the module tree. Okay, so this is a, a little schematic of loading something. So if you had nothing loaded, and then you loaded a compiler, you did module avail, it would show you the compilers that were available. And you might see, for instance, uh, a couple versions of the Intel compiler and a GNU compiler. And then if you chose to load one, say you loaded the Intel 17 compiler, then now if you do a module avail, it will show you more stuff that is available that was built with the Intel compiler that you are now able to load. So for instance, you'll see MKL or NetCDF, you can now load and you'll also see some MPI software. Um, you'll see we have maybe a few different versions of MPI. Then if you load one of those MPIs, 
that will again allow you to see even more stuff. So now you have a package like PNET CDF that couldn't be loaded before you had an MPI loaded. But now that you have Intel uh, compiler loaded and you the MPT uh, MPI library loaded, now you're able to load PNET CDF. So the modules that you have available to you change as you load and unload stuff. And that's why module avail will always show you the same thing. But Sorry, the there is a, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. There is a question in the chat if you want to take a look at that. Yeah, let me pull up the chat window real quick. And I'll answer the second one about will slides be recorded and the video shared? Yes, and we should have those online within a few days. Uh, we'll let you know with a follow-up email when those are ready. The yes, other question is worry about module purge. Yeah, and so module purge, will it, the question is, will module pur purge remove all modules or just unload them? Uh, yes, it, it just unloads them. So everything you have loaded, um, module purge unloads them. They are then later still loadable. You can reload them, uh, if I understand the question. It doesn't delete or remove anything permanently, but it just unloads everything you have. Okay. Right. So uh, things we have available, uh, all the software we have on the system that's managed by modules. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it's just an example of the big categories of stuff we have available. So there's lots of compilers, Intel, GNU, and PGI are common. Uh, we have some debugging and performance tools, DDT and MAP are probably our preferred debugger uh, and performance analyzers. Uh, we have MPT, uh, so MPI libraries. So MPT is the default one. That's the one that kind of is supplied by the vendor of the system. But we also have Intel MPI and Open MPI available. Various I.O. libraries are pre-built, NetCDF and also parallel I.O. libraries like PNetCDF and HDF5. Um, a bunch of analysis languages. I mean, you can use these languages for whatever, but things that are common to use for sort of analysis and post-processing like Python, Julia, R, IDL, MATLAB. Uh, those things are available. We have some convenience tools, things like Parallel, that's kind of like a work, workflow tool that helps you just run small tasks in parallel, in-car compilers, which is a wrapper script we provide, um, things like that. So do, you know, hunt around the module tree and look for stuff that might be useful to you. I should also mention that if there's a tool you really need and you can't find it on the system, feel free to submit a help ticket. We will install stuff um, for you if it's you know, some common piece of software that we don't have installed yet. You can certainly make requests. When you're compiling software, that, uh, that tool I just mentioned, NCAR compilers, is something that's pretty useful. Um, it's just a wrapper script around whatever compilers and MPIs and libraries you have loaded. And what it does for you basically is it adds the include flags and the links flags for you. So for instance, if I needed to, if I didn't have in-car compilers loaded and I wanted to link with NetCDF libraries, I could do module load NetCDF and then I could do an ENV and look at uh, where NetCDF was and it would be some weird path like Glade U app CH opt NetCDF 171 GNU 485 slash NetCDF. And then I'd have to copy and paste that path into a make file somewhere with a dash L flag. Uh, and you just don't want to really remember all that stuff all the time. So if you have the NCAR compilers module loaded, one could simply just um, ignore the linking and it'll be happen for you behind the scenes. So that's a nice convenience tool to know about. It'll be loaded for you by default. Um, another thing when you're, when you're compiling MPI programs, because there are different MPIs available, um, it's just good to remember which one you use to build your program because you will typically need that one loaded to run your program later. Um, and then also we recommend compiling the code on the system where you're going to run it. So, you know, if you're going to run something on Cheyenne, compile it on Cheyenne. If you're going to run something on Casper, compile it on Casper. Um, just because, as I mentioned, there are slight differences in the, the CPUs and going from Casper to Cheyenne can result in errors and going from Cheyenne to Casper can result in subpar performance. So try to build on the system you're building on. And I should mention too, like I, I tried to steer you away from compiling on Cheyenne um, because the login nodes are constrained and they're busy. And so that's true. You don't want to compile at a login node, but you can compile on a batch node. Um, 
there are some commands to facilitate that we'll go over in a little bit here. So you, you can definitely compile large models on Cheyenne, just do it on a batch node. Okay, so uh, if you're running a large task, like a, running a big model or something, um, you wanna be doing it on the batch nodes I just mentioned. So on Cheyenne, uh, you would schedule these via the PBS scheduler, or on Casper, you would schedule this type of work for, via the Slurm scheduler. So sort of the workflow of how you would run a big model. You start off on your workstation, you would get onto Cheyenne uh, via ssh to cheyenne.ucar.edu. That places you on one of the six login nodes. And then now you have available to you 4,000 batch nodes via PBS. Um, those are a, a family of PBS commands that allow you to interact with those batch nodes. You also have from the Cheyenne login nodes access to the Casper nodes. So you can submit jobs via Slurm on Cheyenne to run on Casper. So that's why there's that purple arrow pointing to, to the 26 uh, DAV nodes as well. So both those things are able to be scheduled from Cheyenne. Uh, and then you can also schedule jobs from the batch nodes themselves. You can use Slurm to submit a job to Casper. So you might have like a workflow where you run a big model on Cheyenne and then at the end of that job, you automatically submit an analysis script to run on Casper. Uh, also, you can, from your workstation, you can log in directly to Casper and schedule Casper work to run on Casper. You don't have to go through Cheyenne. So if you're simply wanting to do analysis or visualization work, um, you can directly log into casper.ucar.edu. And then the thing that's common between PBS and Slurm, the things they do, they basically request a certain amount of computing and they request it for a certain amount of time and they request it on a certain amount of hardware. So they use core hours in terms of how they're charged. So that is exactly what it sounds like. It's the number of cores you used multiplied by the number of hours you used them for. That's kind of the money it cost you to run the work you were trying to do. Um, again, you can see how much balance you have left by logging into SAN. Um, and then during computation, this is just a, a thing that catches people sometimes. Uh, temporary files are often created that you don't even know about and their location is uh, set by a variable called temperature. Those will actually, uh, by default, sometimes fill up the slash TMP directory on a node and cause your job to crash. So we recommend setting this TMP DIR variable yourself uh, to your scratch space to avoid potential failures like that. Okay, I'm gonna give you an example of a really simple PBS script and then also its Slurm equivalent. So this window on the left here, the basic underscore MPI dot PBS. Uh, this is a TCSH script and these top few lines here that begin with a hash PBS. Those are commands that are just comments as far as the script is concerned, but the PBS scheduler reads those comments and decides how much computing you're requesting and so on and so forth. So the first line, the dash n hello underscore PBS, that's just the name of the job. So later, that's how you would sort of identify the job if you were checking to see how long it had been running or if it was still queued. Um, the dash A project code, that's the account you wanted to be charged against. So this might be something like UCUB0075 or something, you know, it's a, some project code you'll be aware of. Um, you can look in SAM to see what projects you have available. Dash J O E and then the line below it, dash O PBS job.log. That just means combine the output and the error, put it in a file called PBS job.log. Dash Q regular um, is requesting sort of the standard level of service, the regular queue. There are also premium queues that run at higher priority, but they cost more money. And economy queues that uh, run at lower priority and are much cheaper. Uh, but regular is kind of the place you'll run most of your work. Uh, the dash L wall time, um, the format is wall time equals and then some time limit to let your job run for. The format there is hours, hours, minutes, minutes, seconds, seconds. Uh, separated by colons. So you can see this is a five minute job, a very short one. Um, it is important to pay attention to wall clock time in the sense like if you have a, if you have a job that is only going to run for an hour and you know it'll be done in an hour, then you want to request a, a fairly short wall time. So request an hour or an hour and 20 minutes. That makes it easier for the scheduler to fit your job uh, into a slot. Um, you know, if you say it's going to take 12 hours, the scheduler has to find a bigger hole to place your job in. So you want to be realistic with your wall clock times, but also give them a little bit of padding so they don't uh, die. So, you know, for, if I had a job that was going to take one hour and I said there was an access, a wall clock limit of exactly one hour, but something happened, the job actually needed an hour and two minutes, it would have actually been killed if I only said an hour. So give it a little bit of padding. If your job is going to take about an hour, say, give it an hour and a half of a wall clock time limit. 
uh, but also be realistic and don't make everything 12 hours. 12 hours, by the way, 12 hours is the longest you can have a job running. Um, okay, and then the line below that, the select statement, that's telling PBS how many resources you're requesting. So the format here, basically, the first number, the two before the colon, is saying I want two units, basically, of everything after this. So in this case, that's sort of nodes. I want two nodes. Uh, each of those nodes with 36 CPUs and each of those nodes with 36 MPI processes started on them. So that's a little, little weird. There's always 36 NCPUs available. Um, MPI procs equal 36 doesn't necessarily, so what that's doing, it's not going to prohibit you from using a different number of MPI processors later if you want, MPI tasks later if you want. But that will tell the MPT or the other MPIs by default how many ranks you're expecting to launch on that node. And like I said, this is the first number there is the number of nodes you're requesting. And then the sort of the, all the stuff after that colon is all the stuff that would be on one of those nodes. So because I've selected two nodes here with 36 MPI ranks, then there would actually be a total of 72 MPI ranks in this program. So 36 on each of the nodes. Um, and then continuing on the script again, setting temperature, like I mentioned before, uh, we're doing a module load MPT, so the MPI is available, and then MPI exec MPT, uh, hello world is the example program here, that would run 72 MPI ranks to run the hello world program. Okay, and then here is sort of the equivalent syntax in Slurm. So you can see they're doing more or less the exact same thing. Slurm uses these sbatch commands that are analogs of PBS uh, that, to accomplish the same stuff. So dash J for the job name instead of dash N. Uh, it's still dash A for the project code, dash O to name the output, um, dash P DAV, that's the equivalent of the Q over there. The DAV Q is what you'll be wanting to use on Casper almost all the time. Dash T for the time limit and a similar format for hours, minutes, seconds. Uh, dash N2, that capital N2 is two nodes. And then the line below it, dash dash in task per nodes equals eight means I want to have eight things on each of those two nodes. So again, there's a lot of stuff you can do in both Slurm and PBS. And this little example is by no means exhaustive. So check our documentation uh, for all the options you have available to you for setting up these jobs. They definitely get a lot more complicated than this. But this is the sort of the basics of what the top of any um, Slurm or PBS job will look like. They'll so have some combination of those PBS or SBatch keywords at the top that tell the scheduler how to schedule your job. Okay, so interacting with the schedulers, um, again, they're very similar. They just have different words for doing the same stuff on both systems. So uh, on PBS, if you want to submit a job, you use QSEB and then the script name. On Casper, you would use SBatch and then the script name. Uh, on Cheyenne, via PBS, if you want to look um, at the job status, you use QSTAT and then the job ID. Uh, on Casper, that would be SQ-J and the job ID. Uh, on Cheyenne, well, I should say too, on Cheyenne, uh, you can also use Slurm on Cheyenne. So on Cheyenne, the Q stuff is to use PBS and PBS stuff runs on the Cheyenne batch nodes, but you can also use these Slurm commands to look at Casper jobs from Cheyenne too. So via PBS, if you want to delete a job, you use QDEL. Uh, via Slurm, you use scancel to run a job interactively on Cheyenne. So if you just wanted to get a uh, batch node on Cheyenne and then have it to do interactive development, compiling, things like that. You can do Q interactive um, and then dash A and the project code you want to charge the job against. Exec dev dash A uh, will do the same thing, but it will schedule that work to run Casper. And then you can also do this QCMD dash A with a project code and then dash dash command DXE. So command DXE in that line is a stand in for any sort of work you wanted to run. So I could have, for instance, the command after the dash dash could be make minus J8. And then if I did QCMD dash A project code dash dash make minus J8, it will do a parallel build with eight processors for me, but it will run that on a compute node instead of on one of the login nodes. So like I said before, you can compile on Cheyenne using a compute node. That's how you would do it is using QCMD. You could also use Q interactive to start a job on a node and then you could log into the node and do things interactively. Rory, there is another question um, that might back up on one slide there. Let's see. 
Okay. Uh, is there a trick to estimate the job time for different numbers of nodes and MPI processors? No, there's not a trick. Um, I guess the way I would do it, if it's a code you're totally unfamiliar with, um, you probably got it from somewhere. So ask the person who gave you that code, maybe if you have an advisor or a colleague, if they know about how long it will take it to run. Uh, that's a good first, first thing to check. If not, and you really have no idea, give it a 12 hour wall clock time, see how long it takes. And then the next time you'll have a better idea. Uh, if it only took seven hours, then next time maybe give a wall clock of seven and a half or eight hours. Um, and then if you know how your code scales, so if you know, you know, using 100 nodes, it took two hours, you can sort of reasonably guess maybe using 200 nodes, it'll, you know, so twice as many nodes, it'll take uh, one hour. Um, it probably doesn't scale as well as linearly, but you could use linear scaling estimates to bound the amount of time. Uh, that's kind of how I would triage that problem. Okay, quickly, um, when you're running parallel programs on Cheyenne, uh, I just want to give a little more detail on this select line. Um, so if you're doing OpenMP work only, there's a keyword in there, OMP threads. So if that line in the batch script, um, the dash L select one, if I said NCPUs equals 10, OMP threads equals 10, that's going to give me one node. And on that one node, it's going to use 10 CPUs. And in the OMP threads equals 10, it means it's going to preset the OMP num threads variable to be 10, so that then later when you run your program, it'll be running with 10 threads. You could also below, uh, you know, above that executable name, above the program, you could set OMP num threads yourself to some other value if you wanted, but setting it in the PBS command will um, go ahead and set it for you automatically. And then it's a little trickier if you want to do hybrid OpenMP and MPI jobs. So again, the select line here, in this example, I'm selecting two nodes, uh, 36 CPUs on each node. But then instead of using 36 MPI ranks on each node, I'm using 12. And I'm having OMP num threads set to 3. So you can see if you multiply 12 by 3, that gives you 36. So this job will end up being two nodes. Each node will have 12 MPI ranks, and each of those ranks will be threaded with three OpenMP threads. Uh, so that's how you would do a, a hybrid launch. But you also need, if you, you need to worry about performance. So by default, if you just launch that stuff, the operating system will sort of put the processes and the threads uh, without thinking too much about how memory is allocated. Um, so there's this other command called omplace that you put between the MPI exec command and your executable name. And omplace will lay things out in a smarter fashion for you. So it will decide where, which processors, which CPUs, your MPI ranks will be attached to. Um, and that'll just lead to much better performance. So you want to remember that omplace uh, if you're going to be launching a hybrid program. OK, another class of work that we see um, is sort of when you have a lot of simple serial tasks uh, to run, and they're all really similar, but you want to run, run them all at once um, on a batch node. So we call this command file jobs. Uh, this top box is an example of what a command file job looks like. It's simply exactly what it sounds like. It's a list of commands. So you would make a file that had all the commands you wanted to run in parallel in it. Uh, and then the way you would launch that via PBS um, is in this little box below. So again, this example, you'd select one node. I have four commands I want to run, so I'm asking for four MPI procs. Uh, and then I do MPI exec MPT. And then I use this launch underscore CS, CF.sh, that launch command file.sh is what that stands for. And that's a little script we wrote that will basically take all of the work you have in your command file and run it in parallel. Uh, and this works best if the command times, you know, the time it takes to run command one, two, three, four, in the example above are similar. Uh, because it will tie the whole node up for the amount of time it takes to run this lowest command. So you just want to put work together that will complete in roughly the same amount of time. Uh, to, on Casper, if you want to select specific resources, um, the way you do that, if you look at these three lines at the bottom in green here, this is, for instance, how I would select a V100 node that had two V100s I wanted to use on it. The dash C V100 is a constraint. That means only consider placing my job on nodes that have a V100. The dash dash mem equals 100 gigabytes uh, tells Slurm that I'm going to need 100 gigabytes to run this job, so it'll make sure there's enough memory available for you. And then the dash dash g res uh, means like these are the resources I want. 
and the resources you want here, you want a GPU, it's a V100, and you're requesting two of them. So that's kind of how you parse that out in Slurm land. Uh, and you want to make sure that you don't have typos here because if, for instance, you know, we don't have a node that has 20 uh, GPUs on it, but if you put GRES equals GPU V100 colon 20 by accident, instead of making the submit fail, your job will actually just sit there and wait for us to install a node with 20 GPUs, which will probably never happen. So your job will just pen forever. So um, yeah, it won't give you failures to so make sure the things you're typing actually exist. Uh, okay, again, real quickly, there's uh, queues on Shan, premium, regular economy, and share. Um, regular is where you'll do most of your work. Premium, if you have something you really need to get done, premium jobs will run quicker, but they charge 50% uh, more than a regular job. And economy is where you'll end up running if you run out of money. You probably won't do it on Typus. Uh, and then the way jobs, the charging goes, um, depends on the queue you're running in, as I mentioned. So the number of hours you ran for by the number of nodes you used by 36 cores per node times the queue factor is what your charging is on Cheyenne. Um, and for the share, that share queue, that's enables you to use less than one full node. So you could use a partial node for a certain amount of time in the share queue. Okay, if you're running a GUI program, we basically have two ways to do that. So one is a program called Turbo VNC. Um, you need to install a VNC client in order to do this. And again, check our documentation to download the Turbo VNC client you need. And then when you're logged into Cheyenne, if you wanted to run a, a VNC session, you start by doing this VNC server submit command, dash A with the project you want to run. And then there's quite a few steps to this. So that script will walk you through all the additional setup you need to do to launch VNC. And there'll be another three or four steps of entering one-time passwords and so on and so forth before you can connect. And, when you do, it'll be able to launch like a Linux GUI window for you that's running on the Casper system. There's another way to do that with FastX. So FastX doesn't require a client. Um, you can use a FastX client if you want, but you can also run this in the browser. Um, so for this, you need to be, if you want to run it in the browser, you need to be connected to the NCAR VPN. Um, I'm not going to cover how to get the VPN installed, but that's something you would request from the person that administers your local system. And then once you're in the VPN, you can take a browser and go to fastx.ucar.edu 3300, and that will let you start a Linux session on Casper. And you can do things like you can see in that little window there, I've got a little plot of MATLAB running on Casper. Uh, so if you want to run some GUI tools on the DAV system, use FastX or um, Turbo VNC. You can also just use normal X Windows forwarding, but it's much, much slower. So uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, we're getting to the end of it here, but there's a couple quick things about how to customize uh, your default environment. So um, these little TCSH uh, script um, you're in your home directory, .tcshrc, a lot of you are probably familiar with. Um, the thing that's happening in this file is simply pointing out that you may want to have different settings for Cheyenne than you would have on Casper or some other system. So if you're customizing your Cheyenne environment, you might want to do something like this, where you have an if host name equals some pattern, then make one set of settings and otherwise do a different set of settings. Because you might want things set differently on Cheyenne than on Casper. So you can follow that pattern um, to set things differently for the different systems. Then here's sort of the equivalent logic in Bash um, if you want to have different settings. Uh, changing your default set of modules. So you don't want to put module load commands in your startup files. That can lead to a lot of problems. Um, so it's best to not have module commands in your startup files. Instead, uh, the module command I mentioned before, module save, um, can save a set of modules. So this is an example of if you want to have NCL, Python, NCO, and MKL all loaded every time you log in, then load them one time and then type, type module save default. And then the next time you log into the system, those will automatically be loaded for you. Um, and then similarly, you can have named sets. Other than default, you could name it default one, default two, default three, or something more descriptive. And then you can do module restore whatever you named that collection and it will reload that entire collection for you. Okay, and then this is kind of how you get support. Um, it's a little different than how you would normally get support because we're all working from home. So we don't have walk-in service. Uh, when we're all back at Mesa Lab, hopefully we will have walk-in service again, uh, but at the moment we do not. So. The best way to, if you have a question or a problem on the system, it's to uh, file a support ticket. Um, you can go to the 
sizzle.ucar.edu slash user support getting help and from there that will take you to the portal where you can file tickets. Uh, you can also call the help desk and then that will get forwarded to one of our one of our phones depending on who's on shift. You can also if you would rather we call you back you can just file a ticket and request a call and then we can always call you back too if that's easier. Uh, those are the best ways to get help right now. Also you know the any any day of the week sort of Monday through Friday eight to five one of us is on duty. We can also do Zoom sessions or Google chat hangouts or something if you have a question that requires a little more interactivity instead of walk-ins. Uh, but again, to make us aware of that, you need to file the ticket first. So uh, yeah, if there's any more questions now, let's see, I will take them. And if there are no questions, you can feel free to bug me or one of my colleagues later via a ticket or a phone call or anything else. So any other questions? All right, sounds like no questions. So hey, thanks hey everybody Rory. For hey Rory. Oh yeah. This is, this is Jeanette. I'm just gonna ask my question over voice instead of typing. Is that okay? Of course. Good. Um I have one question. Is there an easy way for me to see why a job is waiting in the queue? Like if it hasn't run for a really long time and it's just sitting there, like you mentioned, is there mm -hmm. any tools I have to see why it is waiting? Yeah, you <laughs> at the end of the day, yes, there are. You can do, for instance, um Q, qstat xf to get a full job listing that'll have a lot of detail in it that you can and it'll give you a reason it's pending sometimes but i would say interpreting the reason things are pending it's not always obvious uh, particularly to you know a, a user who's fairly new to the system if you're looking at the, all this output and it tells you why your job is pending you may uh it may not be clear anyway so yeah there are what you know fuller listings from um, the queue systems about why things are pending, but I'd say go ahead and look at that. And if it's not obvious, file a support ticket and we can help parse it out for you. Um, what, what, what about on the slurm side? What about on the slurm side? Uh, S info. And sorry, I cut you off. Is there something else? Uh, no, I, I mean, again, I, I, I would use, I would just right. use the, uh, you know, uh, S info or SQ and, look at the pending reason that the scheduler tells you. I, I would say the most common reason, like if something is pending erroneously, the most common thing we see is that you have requested some resource combination that can't actually be satisfied. Um, so you can look at what you requested and you can see, oh, well, I accidentally asked for 45 CPUs on that node. There's only 36. Um, so you can parse the, the output of the job. But I would say if it's not obvious to you why something is pending and you think it's pending erroneously, file a ticket. Rory, there is another question in the chat about Turbo VNC and FastX. Oh, okay, yeah. When would you consider using Turbo VNC versus using FastX? I would say in my experience, performance-wise, they're, um, they're both pretty good. So if you have... Um, if you have Turbo v, VNC installed, that's something we've offered longer. If you have it already set up and you're comfortable using it, uh, go ahead and keep using it. I think it works great. There's not a performance penalty or anything like that. FastX we installed um, because it's a little easier to access. Like I said, you can do it through a browser, so it doesn't require installation. So if you, uh, for instance, you're working on a laptop, but you don't have administrator privileges on that laptop, um, you might want to just try FastX. You can do it through the browser. But both work well in terms of performance. Okay, well, thanks to everybody. It looks like that's pretty much exhausted the questions. Um, thanks for attending. And like I said, uh, feel free to ask more questions if they come up later on. And I hope you have good computing. Oh, wait, one more question. Can other VNC versions connect to Turbo VNC? Uh, yes, other VNC clients can also work. Turbo VNC is the one we have linked from our page, but yeah, you can use other VNCs as well.
I'm not sure that every single thing out there works, but I have used, uh, I, I've used the built-in one that used to come with a Mac instead of um, Turbo VNC and that seemed to work fine.